Welcome to GRE. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. It's been said that the average millionaire has seven different income streams. We're going to discuss two distinct income streams that you can add to your life today that lie on the periphery of real estate investing. They are low touch for you because they require little or no management today on episode 448 of Get Rich Education. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE from Altoona, PA to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan and across 188 nations worldwide. I'm Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education. Oh, you can't have just one income stream because that's entirely too close to zero. <laughs> We're talking about two distinct income streams today. People really like the operator and his track record. In fact, he's a longtime friend of mine. We'll talk with him shortly. Next week here on the show, I'm going to talk about the ways that you can raise the rent and add value to your property. But for today, besides the upside that gets many interested in these two income streams, most investments usually have pros and cons. So I'm going to ask about the downside in both. We're talking about the ability to add a couple thousand dollars to your residual income each month with the first of two income streams. ATMs. Yes, automated teller machines. Remarkably, the operator has never missed the monthly distribution or their pro forma return target. What about the future use patterns of cash? Yes, green dollar bills. We will discuss that. It seems as though ATMs just don't care when there's disruption and chaos in the marketplace. They just sit there do their business, and provide you with consistent monthly cash flow. We'll discuss exactly how much. Inflation, not a big deal to ATMs. Recession, they can deal with that. Pandemic, ATMs breezed right through it. Is the use of cash in decline? Well, not with the demographic that ATMs serve. How about the political party in power? That just doesn't matter. In fact, and perhaps this is a little sad, the demographic that ATMs serve is one of the fastest growing in the United States, to this group, cash is still the currency of choice. Some of them are unbanked or underbanked. First, we'll talk about ATMs. Then after that, another diverse income stream for you. What's it like to invest in ATMs and car washes and what's the direction of their future use patterns? For example, wouldn't cash use with ATMs be declining perhaps? Well, today's guest expert recently spoke about ATM and car wash investing at the best ever conference as alternative asset classes that can perform well over the next decade. And when he was finished speaking, there was a line formed at the back door waiting for him so that people could learn more. So settle in, let's learn about what What's happening? I'd like to welcome back onto the show GRE regular and super syndicator Dave Zook. Keith, thanks for having me back on your show. It's good to be back, and I'm looking forward to having this discussion. I love it. Well, Dave, you know, you've been here to discuss ATMs and car washes before, so we want to get updates today, including what investor returns are like, starting with ATMs. Really, that is a predominant thought about ATM investing today. It's that the use of this new technology like Apple Pay or coming CBDCs or even cryptocurrencies are going to cause cash use to decline. And I know that when you were here previously, we talked about year over year cash use and how that looks. So is that a question that you often get? about just the use of cash that an ATM spits out? Yeah, so one of the challenges to the ATM space in investors' minds, in accredited investors' minds is, well, I don't use cash anymore. I'm guessing you don't use much cash anymore. I don't hardly ever use cash. Right. And so that must mean that other people aren't using cash. That is the same as an investor thinking, well, I don't live in a C-class apartment building, so I guess nobody invests in C-class apartment buildings, right? So one of the things, yes, is cash use in decline? The answer is yes to our peer group. 
But when you consider the fact that our demographic who we serve, when I'm saying saying our peer group, I'm talking about you and I, Keith, and probably everybody who's listening to this show, we use less cash than we did three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years ago. Sure. Okay. But the demographic of people that we serve is one of the largest, one of the fastest growing groups in this country. It's when you really look at the facts, look, Back in the early 90s, the Wall Street Journal, there's articles in the Wall Street Journal that talk about the death of cash. By the end of the 90s, cash wasn't going to be around anymore. Huh. When I started, when I got in the ATM space 12 years ago, the kind of the talk on the street was, yeah, but you got Apple Pay and Google Wallet and you got all these this stuff coming on. Cash is going to be dead in two to three years from now. And the fact is, there's more than double the amount of currency in circulation today than there was 12 years ago. There's more currency in circulation today than any time in human history. And the peer group who we serve, the demographic who we serve, uses cash and almost transacts entirely in cash. And that's not going away. We've seen that increase. We've done a lot of market research. We see what's going on, but then we also see what's going on inside our own funds and how people are behaving. It's still a vibrant market. Yes, and you and I have discussed before how some businesses and jurisdictions have tried to ban cash use, but those bans were repealed and it was brought back that you're able to use cash. And you brought up such a brilliant analogy. You as an investor out there, you might be interested in investing in a C-class apartment building, even though if you would do that, you'd probably be less likely to live in one. So yes, a lot of times you're with your circle of friends, you're in your peer group, and you tend to think like they do and everyone lives just like you do. But when we talk about different demographic groups from people that you usually hang out with, one reason I've learned through dealing with you over the years, Dave, is that ATMs are so lucrative for ATM investors because this is going to seem incomprehensible to you, the educated listener, but many ATM users pay 2 to $3 just to get access to a $20 bill. Imagine paying $3 to get access to a $20 bill. And you're thinking, well, who would do that? No one that I hang out with would do that. That's 15%, a 15% surcharge to go ahead and access your own money. But yeah, I mean, that's one reason why these people are financially disadvantaged, but that's why it's lucrative. Yeah. And for those people, it's a way of life. And when you look at how a person's wage or ACH today, somebody works at a factory, their paycheck gets ACH right into their account. They transact in a lot of cash. You know, it saves them for two or three dollars. It saves them from getting in a car. Some of them don't even have a car or getting into public transit and going down the road to the neighborhood bank where they bank at and then stand in line in front of a teller on a Friday night and to try and get, you know, twenty, fifty, hundred dollars in cash. You know that two or three dollars to go down to the corner convenience store, that's pretty inexpensive. But you're right. I mean, there's people who will pay two or three dollars to get a ten dollar bill or a twenty dollar bill. It's just crazy. Now, Dave just gave an excellent example because some people might think, are you taking advantage of these people? You're actually helping serve these people and give them an option. And one thing that I know that you really prioritize doing, Dave, with these ATM investments you've been helping people with for years where they can come invest alongside of you is that for your physical ATM locations, you choose high foot traffic areas. You've heard the saying, what's the three most important things about real estate? And it's location, location, location. Even more so in this investment, because at its core, this is a real estate investment. You're monetizing a two foot by two foot piece of real estate. And you may be taking that two foot by two foot piece of real estate to its highest and best use. So you're monetizing that piece of real estate, but no, you're adding real value in a community and, and serving a community but it's a real estate play. Now, if you, the listener and the viewer out there, if you think cash is going to disappear completely in say seven years, well, then you probably wouldn't be interested in investing in something like this. But the more you read and the more you learn, the more you're going to be informed on that. So talk to us a little bit more about the future of payments, Dave. You mentioned the seven-year contract and that's what this is. It's a seven-year deal. But when you consider the tax impact Plus the first 12 months of cash flow, in that first 12 months, you're getting about 60 to 70% of your principal back 
in that first 12 months from the time your cash flow starts you're getting that first year's tax deduction 80 percent right on the front end you're getting about 60 to 70 percent of your principal back in that first 12 months and then you've got an extra six years of cash flow behind that so although it's a seven-year deal it's not like you have your money at risk for seven years you get your money at risk out in the tax impact you get your money at risk for less than three years it becomes a not only is it a, a really good cash flow and income stream play and you can start really beefing up your monthly cash flow but it's also a tax plan it's one of the ways that i keep myself tax efficient you know because you use that big chunk of depreciation in year one and you start getting yourself to the point where you're living the tax efficient life you start gaining on your wealth building journey you can get momentum quick when you start applying some of those principles and using that depreciation offset the tax liability and some other income. We're talking about how investors get 80% bonus depreciation right there at the beginning of a seven-year hold time. And Dave, is there a specific number of ATMs that a specific investor owns? One unit is considered five or six ATMs. And it matters, and, you know, it depends on what kind and sort of location. There's some ATMs that have dual monitors and there's two people using them at the same time so it really depends on on what atm that is but you're talking five or six atms for one unit one unit is one hundred four thousand dollars. we do sell half units now so you can come in as low as fifty two thousand dollars but that's how it works you buy a unit of atms you put them in our fund we manage the fund for you and you get a portion of that surcharge revenue. It's sort of a three-way split. You got the investor getting about a third of the income or 30% of the income. You get the store owner or the location owner about roughly 30% of the income. And then you got the management company, which is where all the costs flow through. You get the management company getting about 40% of that income. So it's sort of a three-way split. But you're getting as close to the asset as you possibly can get without owning it yourself. And so you're just buying the units, you're paying us to manage them for you and making it totally passive. As Dave and I have talked about on a previous show, people use ATMs for more than just accessing cash. There are more use cases than just accessing cash. But Dave, when we get back to the numbers and we talk about why you have so many repeat investors that have invested in a lot of ATMs with you years ago and want to come back and do this more. And that is because this is a cash flow centric investment besides being tax advantaged. However, you as an investor, you shouldn't expect much appreciation on your six or so ATMs that you hold for this seven year or so hold period. Those things are almost full depreciated in value by the end of your hold period, but this is a tax efficient cash flow centric investment. So Dave, tell us more about how that looks for the investor. Cause I know this is actually a highly predictable income stream for investors. It is highly predictable. We've never missed our monthly distribution yeah. payments and we've never missed our pro forma. And so highly predictable and the depreciation, the way the depreciation works is it, it really, you invest, you get that depreciation, you can use it to offset some other income and you got two choices. You can keep your income stream coming from your ATMs. You can keep that tax-free for the first couple of years, or you can use that even more aggressively. You can use that depreciation to go off and, and use it to offset the tax liability on some other income. At the end of the day, it's about living the tax efficient lifestyle and getting out of those high tax brackets, getting out of that 37% tax bracket, moving yourself down into the 20s and the teens. Reducing your marginal income tax bracket with offsets from this investment. People really celebrate your track record. Tell us about those cash on cash returns and just about that income stream that one has historically gotten. The cash on cash return is uh, right around 26, I think it's 26.1% cash yeah. on cash return. The IRR is a bit lower. It's uh, right around a 20% IRR. And so you mentioned it earlier about how an ATM machine really actually does depreciate. Like, And I'll give you sort of the analogy. When you, do, when you take depreciation against, let's say, a multifamily apartment building, and let's say... 10 years down the road, you sell that multifamily apartment building for a gain, 
you not only pay tax on the gain, you also recapture all of that depreciation that you've used, and, and now you get taxed on that as well. So it's very different in an ATM investment. In an ATM investment, you don't recapture the depreciation. You get a tax break, and that depreciation, you never recapture that. So you really need to almost count that into your total return because that affects your bottom line. That affects your tax impact, and you never recapture it. And so you'll notice, unlike brick and mortar, where normally your cash on cash return is lower and your IRR is higher because you get that residue from sale, here it's flip-flop, just totally different, and you get a higher cash on cash return, a lower IRR, but it's because of the loss of value of your equipment over that seven-year period. In real estate, when you relinquish a property and sell it, unless you do a 1031 tax deferred exchange, yes, you have to pay back the depreciation that you were writing off all of those years. You don't have that obstacle. You don't have that problem with ATMs. And yes, you typically hear about IRRs, which all call synonymously total rate of returns in your real estate as being higher than what your cash on cash return is. But here, this is inverted. This is a cash flow centric investment. And part of the reason why is because your machines, they do go down in value over time while your cash flow stays at a steady high rate, 26.1% in this case. It's been a fun asset class and it's interesting. You know, you talk about how the depreciation works and you try to introduce somebody who's not real savvy on the tax side. You talk about how it works and how it will affect them. And then they see it on their tax return. It's like, yeah. oh my goodness. Yeah, that works. It's like you said. I'm like, oh, well, yeah. It becomes part of many of my investors' tax planning on an annual basis. It's part of my annual tax planning. And so it becomes one of those things where it's just easy to start kind of collecting them and, and making it sort of an annual thing where you just collect more ATM machines, keep yourself tax efficient, and, and really start building those massive income streams. Well, you can learn more and get a hold of the Proforma and learn more about ATM performance and their projected future use patterns and how to get started as an investor if this interests you at gremarketplace.com slash ATM. Dave, thanks for the great update on ATMs. All right. Thanks, Keith. You're listening to Get Rich Education. We've got more with Dave when we come back on car washes, why they're so lucrative, especially when you add a subscription model. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. With JWB Real Estate Capital, Jacksonville Real Estate has outperformed the stock market by 44% over the last 20 years. It's proven to be a more stable asset, especially during recessions. Their vertically integrated strategy has led to 79% more home price appreciation compared to the average Jacksonville investor since 2013. JWB is ready to help your money make money and to make it easy for everyday investors. Get started at jwbrealestate.com slash GRE. That's jwbrealestate.com slash GRE. GRE listeners can't stop talking about their service from Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. They've provided our tribe with more loans than anyone. They're truly a top lender for beginners and veterans. It's where I go to get my own loans for single family rental property up to four plexes. So start your pre-qualification and you can chat with President Chaley Ridge personally. They'll even deliver your custom plan for growing your real estate portfolio. Start at RidgeLendingGroup.com. This is the Real Wealth Network's Kathy Fecky, and you are listening to the always valuable Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. Car washers are a remarkably lucrative real estate business. It's enhanced with a franchise model and selling subscriptions to car wash customers. That's how you get that recurring revenue. So a rainy week doesn't wash out your profits. In fact, in the Wall Street Journal, it recently said, and I quote, 
what they wrote here, there is no other operation on a one acre site that can do one to two and a half million dollars in sales and pocket half of that. So our guest expert, Dave, is back because he helps you get investment returns without having to actually operate the car wash yourself. So Dave, tell us more. I know, for example, much like other real estate, location of a car wash is vital. Even more so with this type of car wash because the whole system is set up to get you a quality wash in two to three minutes. It's designed to get you off the road and back on the road in less than three minutes. So if you can put a really good product like this car wash, everybody that I've ever talked to, whether it's a franchisee, an owner, a a subscription customer, or a one-time user. Everybody gives Tommy's Express Car Wash a giant thumbs up. It's about volume. And you put that on a busy street corner where, you know, there's all kinds of metrics that we like. And, you know, it's you got to be where people are already going. You're not creating a, an environment where you're drawing people to somewhere. You want to, it's all about creating habits. On a Monday morning, my wife gets in her car and she, about 8.15 in the morning, she goes down to Wegmans, about a 15-minute drive. And I promise you, if you would introduce her to Tommy's and she would get a car wash when she goes to Wegmans on that Monday morning, she would do that two or three times, she'd be a customer for life. Like she now created a habit, kind of like a Starbucks, creating a habit. So what we're doing is we're putting this asset in a really good location, we're creating an environment where you don't have to wait in line for 10, 15 minutes, five minutes, get your car wash. It's not one of those white glove people wiping your, it's automated. You get a really good quality wash in two to three minutes. You can get in and out quick. You help partner investor money with a model that's proving itself with the Tommy's Car Wash Express franchise, like you just mentioned. So technology really adds to the efficiency of getting cars through the car wash quickly in order to make this more lucrative. And Tommy's is very tech forward. For example, I know that customers buy subscriptions and they typically use a phone app. To the point of technology and efficiency, you know, you're talking, especially over the last three years, you know, what was one of the top concerns or one of the top challenges for employers was getting good quality people. I mean, look no further when you go to a busy restaurant and, you know, I mean, there there was some real challenges in finding good employees. One of the things, you know, and, and this is due to some of the technology that you just mentioned, you know, we got because of the systems and technology, we can run two to 300 cars per hour through this car wash to get washed. And maybe even better, you can do that with two to three people on site. So very limited overhead in terms of wages, employees. You can pay those employees much better because you don't have like 30 of them. You got three of them. And so really the whole business model, and it also comes back to what you shared earlier about the operating margins. You got 45 to 50% operating margins in this business. It's, in terms of percentage, it's one of the most lucrative businesses that I know of. And it's just fun business to be involved in. Yeah, now, when you talk about moving two to 300 cars per hour through a car wash, are you talking about, you know, physically, we think of a car wash now, are we talking about one long tunnel with the rate like that? Or are we talking about multiple bays? Normally, it's one long tunnel. And the longer the tunnel, the more you can, you know, there's different speeds that, you know, the track will take you through and there's different things inside the car wash that you can activate depending on how busy. I mean, it really is. They're real car wash nerds. I mean, they're techies and it, they really did perfect this product to the point where let's say you have a 100 car wash hour where you're putting 100 cars through in an hour. And now you get into the busy time where it's, you know, people are getting off of work. Where it, now you're ramping up to two to three hundred cars per hour. The speed varies on the track, and it's you know different features of the inside the tunnel kind of kick in because of the volume. So there's a lot of automation, a lot of technology going on inside the wash. As society changes, you know whether it's a gasoline-powered car or it's an EV or it's diesel, 
They all need to go through the car wash. We're talking about that rate at which cars get washed, which is actually pretty important because if I'm a car wash customer, you're talking about your wife's habits earlier with washing her car. If I think about getting my car washed, but I see a long line over there, well, I might not even go in and use that car wash. And then I'll start to think, oh, well, what good is my subscription? So keeping that wash tunnel moving also keeps the line short besides increasing your rate of income. Yeah, for sure. And there is, you know, talking about subscriptions, we're not all about subscriptions, but there's kind of a sweet spot. And we figured out that sweet spot somewhere in the 55, somewhere between 50 and 60% is where you really want your subscription numbers to be. You don't want 100% subscription model. If you were at 90%, that means your subscription model, you're not priced right. Almost like charging five hundred dollars a month for your apartment building, and you're always one hundred percent occupancy. It's not good. You it's actually a problem. Be, not charging. Yeah, that is a problem. Yeah. So that's sort of the things that we're watching. We do want a nice mix of retail customers. We think kind of that sweet spot's in that fifty to sixty percent subscription model range. Oh, that's a great point. And that's really interesting when you think about business models. And a lot like apartment buildings, car washes are based on their income stream amount, but you're going to have a different set of expenses with a car wash than you will an apartment building, of course. Like you're going to have expenses, for example, for water and detergent. Dave spoke a bit about how they keep the labor costs down by having fewer people on site, largely through the use of technology. So we're talking about an innovative car wash type here that's proven itself time. Tommy's Express Car Wash, their footprint geographically just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. And in fact, Dave, I know when we talked about this last year, at least at that time, only Panera Bread and Chick-fil-A, they were the only two franchises that had higher sales revenue per location. Wow. We're at number three, and we're hoping to get to number two here in short order. But uh, Chick-fil-A, that's a hard one to beat. But uh, (laughs) yeah, no, it's uh, one of the top performing franchises in the entire country. Chick-fil-A, those two crucial pickles on that chicken sandwich, you know, it's it's really hard to, to compete with there. You need a really efficient car wash to outdo that. As far as it is on the investment end and how that actually looks like for one that wants to come alongside you and participate, before we talk about what the returns look like, talk a bit about how that is looking for current investors that are already in this investment since we first discussed this last year. We launched this fund as a debt fund. We got into it fairly slowly. We were building a couple washes and we knew that it was going to ramp up, but we had a lot of work to do on the front end. We, were, we had lots that were under contract that we were working on permitting. So we started as a debt fund. We launched phase two as sort of a semi equity. I mean, it was an equity fund, but it, it sort of capped an investor at 1.75. You got all the depreciation. The depreciation was not, you didn't have to recapture the depreciation because you're dealing with a lot of equipment. In fact, car washes are very unique in that you can take bonus depreciation on the building as if it were equipment. Like you don't yeah. need cost sake studies. You don't need, you just bonus depreciation the thing out. Like, you know, the entire building, like it was a piece of equipment right up front. First That's year. rare. Yeah. And then we sort of ran through that model and we have eight operational sites today. We have seven more coming out of the ground right now. We expect to be somewhere around 20 uh, fully operational by the end of the year. And Here's the exciting part. Here's the fun part. We're, we're looking to build 100 of these in five years. And wow. so to really ramp up and take us, get us into phase three. And phase two worked great. Investors got all the depreciation. They got all of the cash flow. I'm working for free, by the way. They got all of the cash flow until they get to their 1.75, and then they exit. Then the GP partners start making money. But that model, why it worked very good, and it's going to get us to about 30-ish car washes, we're ramping up. We want to go to 100, and we're retooling our model now that we've uh, got a little bit of experience under our belt. We see how our operations team is operating and see how these car washes are really taking off and really how our team has made these things perform. We want to go to 100. And to get to 100, we're retooling the model. Our investors have spoken. They said, man, we really want to be, you know, a little bit kind of give some of that backside. You talked about the Wall Street Journal article, and Wall Street Journal came out and said, 
that there's PE firms paying 18 to 20x multiples on EBITDA, and it's just super aggressive. So our investors like to hear that, but they wanted a piece of the upside. So we listened to our investors. We're okay. rolling out an equity model. And just to back up, to jump in, so Dave had been talking about the debt side, about how previously this was a raise on the debt side, and now in the future going forward, this is how you can get in on the equity side investment of car washes. It is an equity model, and it's going to allow the investors, it's going to allow all of our investors to not only be a part of the back end, but there's going to be a 10% preferred return. It's going to be aggressive cash flow throughout the hold, and at the exit, um, investors are going to be with us all the way through and be a part of that upside, be a part of the exit. Talk to us about any of the threats that might be out there, whether that's threats to just the overall model of car washes 5, 10, or 20 years down the road, and then what the competition is like, Tommy's Express car wash versus other car washes. What are some of the threats? We've seen, much like our investors have spoken and expressed their desires to be a part of the upside, and we're getting ready to rule that out to them. The general public has given their opinion uh, with their wallets. And so when you get to understand this model and, and how it works, and then you start paying attention to a lot of the other car washes out there and the look and appearance and how they work, and it takes longer and there's lines and you know some of them are full service. And it, you know it's pretty inconsistent, but consumers have spoken and they want this product. And Tommy's is kind of the innovative leader in the car wash space. And so they're really all about just, listening to the consumer and get them what they want. Consumers want a good quality wash for a fair price, and they want to get it quickly and efficiently, and that's what we're delivering. So there's competition in the space. There's only one or two competitors of ours who we would say, okay, they are there, so we're not building across the street. There's not really a need for us to be there if there's that competitor is there. But most of our competitors, if we were to put a Tommy's Express in a neighborhood, we would steal the show. And we have what consumers want, and they'll come to us. When I think about long-term use patterns, Dave, just anecdotally, I think of my own lifespan. I only seem to notice more car washes in cities as time goes on per capita, not fewer. In fact, growing up, my dad used to wash his car by hand in or right next to the garage or old Subaru legacy station wagon. Sometimes I would help him out. Well, he doesn't wash it anymore. It's more efficient to go drive through a car wash. That almost seems to be a vestige of yesteryear where you would regularly wash your own car in your driveway. Well, there's two things there. One is there's a lot more people living in apartment buildings and, and less out in the country in suburbia. So the, even having the ability to wash your car in some places doesn't make sense. But there's another thing too, you know, that by the time I started regularly using a car wash where I actually had to pay some organization to wash my car, I could have bought the car wash. <laughs> now, I mean, you see it all the time. You got teenagers, got a nice vehicle and they don't even think twice they're going through and spending eight or 10 or 15 bucks to wash their car. And I was like, Oh my goodness. Okay. But times are changing and it's becoming a standard thing to get your car wash, the car wash and forget the garden hose and the bucket and the soap. The car wash I use most regularly, the highest tier one now costs $18. That's where they use, you know, rain X on the windshield and everything else. But as far as when it comes to the investor perspective, this is one of those investments, Dave, where you recently spoke at the conference that people are lining up at the back of the room to want to learn more because they're so interested in this investment. I know oftentimes car washes have high cash flow and high tax efficiency for the investors. So tell us about how that's expected to look here on the equity side. You get 100% bonus depreciation over five years. You get a big chunk of that in the first year. Because of the amount of development that we have in the fund, you're getting less than half of it the first year, around half of it, maybe just a little bit less than half of it the first year. So you get a big chunk of your depreciation in year one, and then you get the rest of the depreciation in the four years following that. It's so pretty aggressive on the depreciation side. But then on the cash flow side, 10% preferred returns. You've got multiples that are in the two and a half to three X in five to seven years. You're talking aggressive returns and you're talking aggressive uh, bonus depreciation for tax impact. You need to be an accredited investor. And what's the minimum investment? 
So minimum investment is $100,000, and you do need to be an accredited investor. Tell us about the expected hold time. We're modeling it five to seven years. So while a private equity firm, and we've seen some pretty lucrative offers already, but we've seen, let me back up a second. So this industry is so fragmented that the biggest player in the room has accounts for about 5% of the global revenue. Wow. So that's how fragmented this space is. So there's real opportunity and institutions are desperately trying to get their foot in the door because they see that it's a recession resistant business. They see that it's a it's got strong operating margin. The Wall Street Journal talked about that where you know just crazy operating margin. So they're desperately trying to get their foot in the door and get a foothold in the space and get a little traction in the space. There's not hardly any people who they can write $100 million checks to. We're building a portfolio that somebody would be able to write a billion dollar check for in a couple of years. And so when that happens, we feel like the more mature this space, the more mature this portfolio is, the more cream we can squeeze out for our investors. And so that's where we're going with it. We don't believe that we'll exit in two to three years, but it could happen. But we're modeling out for five to seven years. In case it takes that long to sure. get returns on the conservative side, five to seven years. And yeah, I learned a little something there. Okay, the biggest player in the space only has about a 5% share, very fractured, much like real estate itself is. Well, Dave's one of our GRE marketplace providers. You probably already know that. So if you want to learn more, I'd encourage it and see what makes this business so lucrative. You could do that at GREmarketplace.com slash car wash. Dave, it's really been stimulating to think about some of these alternative real estate investments. Thanks so much for coming back onto the show. Thanks for having me, Keith. It was fun. On the ATMs with 104K invested, that has recently generated $2,262 per month. $2,262 and they've never missed the monthly distribution or their pro forma return target. And if you go invest quite a bit more than that amount, there is something new to announce, and that is the existence of financing with ATM investments. That has the potential to amplify your return some more. So with ATMs, it's a strong cash-on-cash -cash returns, and the IRR, along with the quick return of capital, that's what's making it so popular. They have been delivering them to this group for more than a decade now. Now, the operator, Dave, he's really proud of what they're doing, and that's why he wants to give the opportunity for you to get on the ground in person and see just what they're doing. In fact, in only 10 days, there's a car wash and self-storage investor tour. Yes, it is a one-day investor tour on May 18th in Columbia, South Carolina and you are invited. You'll see a Tommy's Express car wash and more. Meet the team. Ask questions about the business plan. There is no cost to attend. You can meet Dave there as well. You'll learn more about that and with hotel accommodations and everything else after you get the free investor report at GRE Marketplace. We're talking about world-class operators in the car wash space here. When you have multiple diverse income streams in your life, what you've done is you've made your income resilient. So to connect more and learn more and see pro formas on adding an income stream to your life in the ATM space, if that interests you, start at gremarketplace.com slash ATM. For car washes, visit gremarketplace.com slash car wash. Until next week, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.